Glory to God. Good looking crowd today. We are glad that you're here. Amen. I want to jump right in to a message I've entitled uh, The Eternal Purpose. And if, if we would, let's go to Romans chapter 8. I'm going to put up on the screen for you too. And if you have your Bibles, let's open them there. Romans 8, 18 through 21. Jump right into the Word. Praise the Lord. Good to have my my daughter, Rachel, back visiting with us this morning and uh, singing on the praise team. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 18. Praise the Lord. The Bible says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. Everybody say, in us. And that's something, something to think about. The present suffering of the effects of the fall that are still left over in the enemy's world that's still around us, and the present suffering don't even compare with the glory that will be revealed in us. It goes on to say, the creation waits in eager expectation and what's the whole creation waiting for with an eager expectation that it's coming? Waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. Folks, that's you and I. The sons of the living God to be fully revealed in all the glory that our Creator has, praise the Lord, through, us, through Jesus Christ and now in us, praise the Lord. For the creation was subject to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from the bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. There's that word again, glorious, glory, the glorious freedom of the children of God. So it's like it's not only um, the people... But all of creation, the creation itself, struggling with the bondage from the fall, waiting to be completely liberated uh, with the glory revealed in the sons of God. It's amazing. Now, looking at that, so we see this, this glorious freedom, this future glory, the sons of God, the glorious freedom, the children of God. Now look at Romans 3. And I've been saying this a lot lately, trying to get this principle and this truth by the Spirit in you so that we can understand it deep. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of what? The glory of God. Now, when we think of sin, a lot of times we instantly think of, you know, we instinctively also in our upbringing and everything, we think of the consequences of sin. We think of the judgment associated with, you know, with sin and judgment, condemnation, hell, and the problems, you know. But I want to just share from a different angle what God's thought is, you know, God's thought is about that problem is not focused on the judgment and the consequences in hell, but when God thinks of sin, He thinks of it in these terms, of the glory that we miss. Hello? Yeah. When He thinks of sin, see, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory. We always focus on the sin and its consequences and its problems and its condemnation and guilt and shame and hell. And God's thinking of I don't want them to sin for the glory they'll miss. Amen? All have sinned and, sinned and fallen short of the glory, and God's heart is to bring back the glory, and His focus is on the glory that's missed. Not on, you know, the judgment, punishment, all of that. So the result of sin, folks, is we, we forfeit the potential for God's glory. We forfeit God's glory. We forfeit His best. We forfeit what we're created for to walk with Him and in His glory. So as a result of sin, we fall short of what could be in our life. Come on, we all can relate to this. 
You know, you've sinned, and sin has led to bondage, and that bondage has led to trouble, and the trouble in life has messed up a lot of things in your life, and you can look at all those areas of your life that's been affected by that sin, and it's way short of what it could be, right? It's way short of the glory that God has for you and what your life can be in Him. So when we sin, you know, we focus so times in the church so much on the sin when God's focusing on getting back to glory. Amen? He's a loving God. He's a, a good God. He created us for glory. He, for glory. he wants to bless you with it. So all have sinned and fallen short. So the result of sin is forfeiting the glory. The result of redemption. Redeemed. Jesus came to purchase us back, to pay for the price of sin and purchase us back. The result of the redemption is we are now qualified to walk in the glory again. Isn't that good news? Still have choices of how to do that, how to get there, how to walk in it. But you're, you know, the result of that redemption is now you're in right standing with God. There's no more sin barrier to keep you short of the glory. There's no more, there's nothing left. Hey folks, God wants to bless you. And when you're in Him, there's no more barrier between you and walking in the glory of God. You know, what we lack sometimes is the knowledge of the promises and the knowledge of His will and His way and to renew our mind to the truth of it so that we can walk in it. Amen? So there's no more barrier of sin between God and man, any man who has received by faith the answer, our redemption in Christ Jesus. So we can say in a big picture, you know, the purpose of redemption is glory. You know, God wants a family to enjoy forever in glory. A glorious time. A glorious new heaven and glorious new earth where we're walking with Him in glory. And there's nothing, there's no hindrance, there's no bondage, there's no problem between that. Go with me. To Luke, I want to show you this story from a little different angle too. Luke chapter 15. We know that's the chapter with the story of the prodigal son. We will also see he explains it three times. The parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. Okay. Now I want to just point out, first of all, because most of us know that story quite well, Let's point out, first of all, Luke 15, 24. It says there, For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. The son was, he is lost, and now he is found, and they began to celebrate. Whose loss was it? It's a question. I want you to think about, we'll answer. Whose loss are we, are we talking about? Well, he's, he's trying to explain. Yet yeah, he says there in Luke 15, the parable of the lost sheep. Then Jesus told him this parable, Luke 15, 3. Suppose one of you have the hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? When he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. Praise the Lord. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. So when the sheep was lost, whose loss was it? It's the shepherd's loss. Yes. So it's the shepherd that had the loss. The shepherd lost, had, had a lost sheep and was willing to do anything to go and find that sheep. In the same way, the parable of the lost coin, verse 8. Suppose a woman had ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully till she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. The parable is about the lost coin. Whose loss was it? It was the woman's loss. Well, folks, in the same way, in the parable of the lost son, 
Whose loss was it? It was the father's loss. And he wanted to find the lost son. He wanted to bring him back. Amen? Mankind was lost, and it was the Father's loss. He wanted to bring mankind back. He wanted to find each and every one of us, bring us back into the fold. You see, God is not satisfied with just His Son. He wanted many sons. Yes. He wanted, praise the Lord, to reap a harvest from all the nations and have a family. God wants a family of sons and daughters that He can enjoy forever. Praise the Lord. And the whole plan, praise the Lord, for His glory, to reveal His glory. See, God is love, and love has to have someone to love. We are the object of that love. He's satisfied when we, when we receive His love and we are in His love, praise the Lord. We love Him. He loves us. And praise God, we have a joyful, harmonious relationship with nothing hindering or nothing blocking that relationship. All sin and problem and guilt and shame is removed. We can enjoy one another fully because there's no barrier. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So we're looking at the parable, the lost coin, it was the woman's loss. The lost sheep, it was the shepherd's loss. The lost son, yes, he was lost. Yes, he was suffering. Yes, he was short of the glory. But it was the father's loss. And praise God, it says here in Luke chapter 15, finally, verse 17, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. And I love to point out one word in this next verse. It says, but while he was still a long way, his father saw him and was filled with wrath and judgment. No, that's not what it says. His father saw the lost son who was struggling and it was the father's loss and he wanted him back. And the way to get him back, praise the Lord, was not wrath and judgment. It's not his way. It doesn't say the father was when he saw him come, it was filled with... No, the Bible says the father saw him, praise, a long way off. No matter how far off you've been, the father saw you and is calling you back to him. It's the father's loss. He wants you so bad. He wants us so bad into his family. He sent his only son to make a way to remove the barrier that you might come in. And he's reaching out to you, not with judgment, not with wrath, not with punishment, not with guilt, not with shame. What did the Father do? This is a picture. Jesus is telling us what the Father's like through this parable. A parable is a story that we about things we can understand on earth to show us something deeper about the Father. So in this parable, he's showing us the Father's love. He says... The father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. Yes. Yes. Whenever you're struggling, whenever we were far away, a long way off, he saw us, had compassion on us. And he says he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy. But the father said, quick and restored his son to his rightful position, put on the best robe, put on the ring, praise the Lord, give him back the authority he had as a full rights as son. You don't come back to him and say, well, you've been away for a while, you've been struggling, so you can come, but you know, you need to sit on the back row for a while, and you need to do this, 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 and this, and we'll wait for a while and see how you're doing, and then we might let you stand and worship with us, then we might let you lift your hands, then we might, you know, you know, let you be up. No, no, no. He came back and praise the Lord right away. God fully restores him to his full sonship. See, he wants us in our full right place as sons and daughters of the living God. Hallelujah. Now, from Luke there, just flip a few more pages. Go to John chapter 1. John 1.
so man was astray, born with a sin nature, and the whole world was now corrupt. The leader God put in charge, Adam, over the earth, had now fallen a sin nature and was corrupted, and everything he ruled was also corrupted. The whole thing was out of whack. But yet God so loved mankind while they were sinners that he always had a plan to make a way. And the Bible says in John 1, verse 14, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, other versions say the only begotten Son. Okay? The one and only Son, the only begotten Son, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Praise the Lord. Truth and grace will always go together. It's the truth of God's grace that sets you free. It's not, it's not the unfilled full picture of wrath and judgment of the old covenant. No, it's the truth that Jesus fulfilled it and ushered in a new and better covenant. The truth of His grace. Truth and grace is always on the same side. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. But the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us, and we've seen His glory, the glory of the one and only, the only begotten. The only begotten Son, one and only. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, He gave His one and only, or some versions say, only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So, here was all the people on the earth, all of the people, all of mankind from Adam, were God's creation, but not God's sons and daughters. Jesus comes as the only begotten Son. The only one. Amen? The only begotten Son of the living God. People like to think, and it's quoted on the TV shows and news and lyrics and songs and stuff that, oh, we're all children of God. We're all created by God. But something has to happen for you to be a child of God. There's childs of God and there's children of the enemy. There's children of the fallen nature. Okay? And there's children who were born again into the family of God by our faith in Christ. But if you're walking around out there and you haven't died and been born again, you're not a child of God. You're a creation of God and God loves you and wants you to be a child of God. Matter of fact, you're a lost son out there and he loves you so much, he sent his son to bring you back because it's the father's loss and he wants you back. He wants you to be his son. He wants you in his family. Amen? So praise the Lord. Here we see the only begotten Son, but we know that God wants sons and daughters, a family. He wants more than one. Revelation 1.5 says this. If you flip there, we'll put that up there too. Revelation 1 verse 5. Praise God. It says, And Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. So the only born, the only begotten, now the Bible calls him the first begotten. You see? So at once, at first when he came, he was the only begotten son, but God's heart, his plan, his purpose is to have many sons and daughters. So out of the first begotten, praise the Lord, there would come many. Amen? So there was the only begotten, and the only begotten becomes the firstborn, the first begotten of many. Praise the Lord. Um, it also says it, go with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, and look at verse 29. Romans 8, 29. For those God foreknew, how many know that God knew you before you were born? He knew you before you were born. Knit you together perfectly in the womb. He knew you. He called you. He says, those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed. How are you being conformed? Into the likeness of his son. 
All the Christians out there, praise the Lord. You are destined to be conformed like Jesus. Destined to be conformed like Jesus. Okay? He, praise God, you're conformed to the likeness of His Son that He might be, Jesus might be, the firstborn among many brethren. So I'm just emphasizing the point to you church, today, church, that Jesus was the only begotten, but God's plan was to make Him the first begotten of many. Amen? He was the only begotten Son, and the glory of the Father was in Him, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten, the one and only. So to look at Jesus is to see the glory of God. To look at Jesus is to see the life of God walking around on this earth in full glory. Amen? So we see how it can be, what it's like, Jesus Christ, the fullness of God on the earth. Praise the Lord. The only begotten becomes the first begotten. And then it goes on to say, and those he predestined, that's me and you, he also called. For those he called, he also justified. Past tense, you are justified just as though you've never sinned justified those jesus called you were lost okay you've been found hallelujah he paid the price he washed your sins you have died your old nature that was a sinner has died has been buried you have been resurrected in christ jesus and you are justified you're a new creation just like you've never sinned and you're not a sinner because the justification of christ amen those he justified, watch it, takes it to another step. He also what? Glorified. Okay, so those, praise God, he's chosen you, he's predestined you, he called you, then he justified you, took away all your sin, put it in himself, died on the cross. When he died, you died. When he was buried, you buried. When he rose, you rose. And how did you rise? You rose justified, just like you've never sinned. But praise God, he also said, you rose glorified. Everybody say glorified. So all have sinned and come short of the glory. Now because of Jesus, the glory has been brought back to you. Now you can have a glorious marriage. You can have glorious children. You can have glorious relationships. You can have glorious church. You can do glorious work for the kingdom of God because the glory of God has been brought back to the earth. How? By Jesus Christ who came in the fullness of His glory. Are you with me? Hallelujah. It is not he bled and died for your sin just to wash your sins that you won't go to hell. No, it's so much more than that. He wouldn't leave you in that state bound to the struggle of this world, bound to the sin nature, bound to all the struggle. No, no, no. He wanted much more than that. We lost the glory. He wanted to give the glory back. And the Bible says here that it is done, that he, get, he justified you and he's glorified you. Amen? Hallelujah. Isn't that amazing? That's why we call it the gospel, the good news. For so many, it's almost too good to be true. Some who are listening here who maybe always thought it was about sin have, you know, hearing, wow, man. So it's not all about sin? Jesus already took care of that? Yeah, and it's, it's about walking in His glory now? Yes. Some struggle to believe that even now. It's no longer about focusing on sin. He's already handled that. And you have to consider yourself dead to it. And now we're alive to Him. So now let's learn how to walk in Him and walk in His glory. And have a glorious life in Him. And shine that glory out to others. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can we say that now, Lord, or that's later? You see, I'll get ahead of myself here from my notes, but that's okay. You see, the glory that's in you shines out, and people see it. When they see the fruit of the Lord in you, they see the glory of God, and it draws them. You see, in the tree of life was God. It's God's life. In God is life. Without God, there's no real life. People who are walking around there without God from Jesus Christ are walking dead. The zombie movies are really true. 
they're not really alive. According to the Word of God, their heart might be beating, they might have brain functions in, in and out with their lungs, but they're not alive till they're in Christ. Real life is in God. Outside of that is not real life yet. They're walking around, but they're walking dead. And when we were dead in our sins, God made us alive. So in God's way of thinking, people who aren't alive in, in Him aren't alive yet. Can you get that? It's supernatural. It's spiritual. His ways are higher than man's ways. We think people are alive when the heart's beating. No, no, no. So when we were dead, who made us alive? God did. God made us alive. He drew us. We were lost. His light was shining. We came to the light, and he made us alive. Hallelujah. It's a supernatural thing. He made us alive. So in the garden, God is the life. But how do you take part of the life? You have to eat the fruit. What, did, what could have they eat? What did we eat to take part of life? Jesus is the fruit. When we take the seed of God, the Word of God, the Word was planted in the earth, and lest a kernel of wheat fall to the ground and die, it produces nothing. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. It was talking about Jesus. He's the Word of God planted in the earth, and now it's produced much fruit. How? Because you heard the Word and tasted and see that it was good and took a bite and swallowed it, and now Christ is living in you. Hallelujah! So when the tree of life is still there and Jesus is the fruit, we take the tr from the tree of life and when we eat it, praise the Lord, we become a part, hallelujah, of the life of God, hallelujah. You know, he, Jesus, he's the vine, we are the branches, we've taken part. And now that the life of God is in you, the glory of God has come back, now there's glory in your marriage, glory in your life, glory in your job, glory in how you think, how you talk, how you walk, and people see the glory of God in you, what do they want? They want to taste and see some of the fruit. You have love, joy, peace. They say, wow, that dude's changed. Give me a bite of that. And they'll pick some off of your life and take a bite of the fruit of the Spirit. And when they take a bite, they swallow the same seed that you did, and his name is Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. So the kingdom of God goes from Glory to glory, from step to step, is filling the whole earth. Amen. Glory to God. The first begotten, the only begotten, became the firstborn. Praise the Lord. And whom he, see it says, that he might, Romans 8, 29, look at it again. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. The only begotten became the first begotten. Praise the Lord. We who believe in him are now begotten of him. Hallelujah. And we are born like him with the same eternal life. Like him. Eternal life. From the Father, the life of God now in us. That's who we are in Christ Jesus. Praise God. I can, uh, we can get you to walk in more glorious life, in more fruit, without the struggle of sin by teaching you who you are in God than by coming here and telling everybody about their sin. Amen? That's missing the mark. That's not right. That's the opposite of God's plan. He, we've fallen short of glory. He wants to give you back the glory. So we want to teach you who you are after you've accepted Christ. I, I'm preaching to mostly saints here. Hey, get me in front of an audience of mostly sinners, and we'll, we'll preach about you know, the struggle with sin and the answer to sin, and they come you know, and, and receive it. But man, I want to equip the saints for the work of the ministry and teach you who you are in Christ, not try to get you back to teach you who you were in Adam. That's so messed up. So praise the Lord. That's why this church and so many others like it around the world that are teaching this truth of new covenant grace are seeing so much fruit in their ministry. We're seeing fruit in your life. I'm seeing love, joy, peace. 
I see, I see the fruit of the man. I see marriage is blessed. I see business is blessed. I see, we see people walking in fruit. Why? Because we're teaching them who they are. Hallelujah. That's right, Cecily. Amen. Amen. So, that he might be the firstborn. Now, let's look at it again from another Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. Hebrews 2, 10. In bringing many sons to shame. In bringing many sons to guilt. And bringing many sons in to stomp on their toes. Oh, I like service today. Man, he stomped on my toes. Is that what we're really called to do as your pastor? To stomp on people's toes and crush you? And tell you, you know, you're not trying hard enough. You're not praying hard enough. You're not reading hard enough. You're not dressing right. You're not acting right. You're not quite doing your part living it up. To the standards that Jesus has set. Is that help? Does that help anybody? No. no. Thank you, God. Amen. It doesn't. But to speak the truth of what the word says about you already, that you have been justified. And to explain it enough in different ways so you receive it, and then you walk around feeling like, hey. You know what? I was a sinner and I was lost, but because of Jesus Christ, now I'm cleansed. There is no sin. I'm born again. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. I'm in the family of God. He'll never leave me or forsake me. The righteousness of God is in me. That's who I am. In fact, the Bible says, uh, uh, you know, we are the righteousness of God in Christ. Now, praise God, I'm bearing the fruit of the Spirit for all to see. Hallelujah. Lord God, it's a wonderful life walking in your glory. I'm glad, praise God, even though Adam partook of the wrong tree, I I have now had a choice and I partook of the right tree. I have eaten from the tree of life. Amen. To know who you are in Christ Jesus and quit thinking of yourself as a filthy, rotten, lost, fallen sinner. Really, really thinking that way and speaking it is saying, Jesus, your blood wasn't enough and you left me still as a sinner. Lord, come back and do something else. What you did wasn't... God, send a different one. That one didn't do enough. When you call yourself a sinner and keep thinking like that, that's what you're saying to God about His precious Son. And He's trying to tell you how precious the blood is that it's washed you yesterday, today, and forever. And if you struggle back out there in the world and you start slipping up, falling away, from this truth. You know what we need to do for you? Come to you and remind you that you've been found. Remind you that you've given your life to Christ. Remind you that you're saved. Remind you that you're righteous. Remind the truth of the Word. Because Satan's tried to block it and say you're no good, you're still this, you're still that, and got you to swallow a lie and it's messing you up by getting you back out there. So we, the saints, come to you, not picking on your sin and bringing that out. You already know it. We're here to tell you, no, this is not who you are. You're a born-again believer. I know you because I see you how the Father sees you. If any man be in Christ, you are a new creation, and that Word will bring them around a whole lot faster than trying to step on their toes and bring it out with guilt. Glory to God. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, that tree of life, everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering, both the one who makes men holy who makes us holy? Jesus. Hallelujah. The one who makes men holy, who sanctifies them. Sanctification is set apart holy unto God. Okay? We're sanctified. We're set apart. We were in the world. Okay, now through him we're died, buried, resurrected, and now we present ourselves to him separate, set apart from the junk of the world, and now we're sanctified, holy. Who did it? 
That way, we didn't sanctify our health, ourself by crucifying our flesh, by battling every day and winning the battle. No, no, Jesus won the battle, and my faith for my victory and my sanctification is not in me trying to do better. It's in what he has already done. It's the finished work of the cross. I'm sanctified holy right now. I'm not working on it. I'm not trying to do it myself. He sanctified me. He did it all. He died, I died with Him. I was resurrected in Him. And He set me apart wholly for His work. And He, the same one who saved me, is the same one who can keep me that way. See, so many are thinking in their mind, you're struggling with it even though you believe the Word, but your mind says, well, I got saved by grace, but I got to keep my salvation by my works. Really? Good luck with that. How's that working for you? No, you got saved by grace, and you're sanctified by the same grace, and you keep your salvation by the same grace. And if you trust in the grace, it'll take you a lot farther living it than trying to trust in your own works at what you got to do and don't do. It's amazing. That's why we call it amazing grace. It's amazing grace. Hallelujah. In bringing many sons to where? To glory. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. God is our Father, but Jesus, in the form of He came as a man, is our big brother hero. Hallelujah. Oh, now don't, don't, don't misinterpret my words. Like, there's only one God, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and these three are one. But yet... God so loved us, he sent his word to manifest in the form of a man like us. He became like one of us so that we could see him, feel him, touch him. The only way to get to know God is God became a man so we can get to know God through him because Jesus is the fruit that we ate to become part of the tree. You with me? Hallelujah. So, amen. He's bringing many sons to glory. He says, I am not ashamed to call them brothers. You're looking at a brother of Christ. Jesus calls me brother. I'm his little brother. He's my big brother. And he's my hero big brother. I couldn't do it. I couldn't make it. I owed a debt I couldn't pay. I deserved to die and go to hell. And he stepped in for me in the gap. And he died in my place. God, the Father, accepted what He did for me. He accepted it. As his blood was precious to God enough that He accepted what He did for my payment for all eternity. He ex Amen. He accepted, God accepted what Jesus did. Jesus, my big brother hero, He's not ashamed to call me brother. He's not, you know, he's not a brother that says, no, you know, he, he's, with his, he's with Moses and Elijah and they're hanging out and they look at me and say, no, nah, we don't know that dude. He's, you know, no, no, no. Jesus not ashamed to call me brother. I'm a brother of Christ. Through him, I've been welcomed and accepted into the family of God. I'm no longer of this world. I belong to the kingdom of God, righteous and holy, and now the kingdom has come back to the earth because the kingdom is in me, and where I go, the kingdom goes, and where praise we walk, the kingdom walks, and what I say, kingdom comes out, hallelujah. And when I lay my hands, kingdom comes out, praise the Lord. And when we invite folks to church, it's by the kingdom you've been invited to Christ. It's the kingdom of God, praise the Lord, is in you, hallelujah. You are no longer a person of the world. You are a person of God. You're like a new species, hallelujah. You're different. Christ is in you. You see, when Adam ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, okay, he had a choice. God said he put, hey, I've given all these beautiful trees, plants you can eat of. Everything wonderful, you know. But in the midst of the garden. Why did he say that? Why didn't he just say in the garden? No, in the midst of the garden. The middle of the garden. A prominent spot set apart special for these two trees. There's a special place in the garden where there was a tree of life, which is God's life. 
and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the serpent tempted Adam and said, you know, did God really say this? You know, do it this way. Take and eat and you will be wise. And you'll know good from evil and you'll be able, you'll be wise enough to make your own choices independent from God of what's right and what's wrong. You see, you don't need God to tell you how to live or what marriage is supposed to look like or how to raise your children or how to form your government of a nation or how to do church or how to do it. You don't need God to tell you these things. If you eat of this tree, you can put the finishes touches on what, how God created humanity and now you'll know good and evil, be like God, and you can make your own choices of what's right and what's wrong and how to live and how to work and what to do with your money and how to treat your wife and you know all of these things. You make your own decision. In other words, hey, I want to be my own man. I don't want no church, no pastor, no book telling me what to do. No way. I'm an independent dude and nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'm going to be my own dude. Well, you're missing something. You didn't create yourself. God created the world and you. It would be wiser to let Him be your God and trust in what He says is right and wrong than making your own decisions. So Adam chose of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Folks, we now we have knowledge of good and evil. We've seen it all over. You know, we grew up in the knowledge of good and evil before we were born again. Okay? Knowledge of good and evil isn't wrong in itself. The knowledge of it. But choosing to, I'm going to be my own God and make my own decisions independent of you. That's the problem. I don't need, I'm not going to live dependent on your word on how to treat my wife or love my children. Or how to operate a city or a government or laws or mankind. I believe mankind, we can, we can have, you know, we've got brilliant men, women, we can put them in charge and put them in leadership and let them write books on philosophies of government, communist manifestos and this and that and have all these different ideas of how to run the world. And if man grows smart enough and high enough, we can put our intellect together, reach the stars, build a tower to Babel. We can do all of these different things. And mankind, we can achieve, you know, world peace. We can clean the environment. We can stop, you know, solar this and that. We can save the whales. We can save mankind if mankind puts our intellect together we can be our own god and we can save the planet and our species and as a matter of fact the biggest problem in mankind that we're going to die hey the scientists are already working on that they've got new genes new things to, to put together and they're already trying to make man live forever you know put your brain in a box and freeze it and stuff like that they're already working on that's mankind's solution we don't need you god if we get our our smartest and brightest people together, we can figure all this out ourselves, and we can make the world a great place. We don't need you, God. That's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I don't want to be dependent on... That's the same tree many eat from most of their life. No, God, I see the invitation. There's churches on every corner. It's on radio, TV, but I won't watch it. I won't listen. Yes, my mama had a book like this in the house, but I don't want to pick it up. I don't want to read it. I'm going to do things my way. You're, we're just like Adam saying no to the tree of life. Yes to my own knowledge of good and evil. Are you getting it? You understand the two trees a little better now? There was two trees in the garden. It was a choice. And it had to be a choice because if he made everybody eat of the tree of life, he could make your life perfect, but you'd be like a robot. You still have a choice. The choice is still out there. The life is, is in God. Outside of God, there is no life. Praise the Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. John 12, 24. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it won't bear anything. But if it dies, it will bear much fruit. Jesus, the Word of God, came to this earth, praise God, because He wanted, God wanted many sons. The first begotten, the only begotten, became the first begotten of many. And He 
grew, praise the Lord, died on the cross, and we who believe in Him, praise the Lord, we partake of that seed of the Word. And a seed will only reproduce its own kind. The seed of Adam reproduced fallen man. The seed of Christ will reproduce Christ in you. Spiritual man, holy man, right with God, no sin, justified and righteous. That's what's in you. That's the truth of who you are. Yes, it's housed in an earthen vessel. And praise the Lord, we still have, live in a fallen world. And sin is not completely eradicated, but you are, you're dead to it. So we still have to deal with it. But He's given us the victory on the inside. So if we consider ourselves dead and alive with Him, and we understand that we're part of a new species of people on earth, then pro folks, I'm telling you, if you would live this way thinking, you know what? I did have all these struggles. I'm dead to sin. I'm alive to God. Now the life I live is not my own. It's Christ purchased it. So my life, my hands, feet, mouth, eyes, everything is His. I belong to Him. Now Lord, continue to fill me with Your truth and Spirit as I study and grow in Your Word and let me walk this thing out. Teach me how to walk. Hey, I'm encouraging you to walk this way. Walk in the way where you think, hey, I'm right with God because of Christ. I'm in the family of God. Hallelujah. Everything is good. Glory to God. So now that all this is, you know, right with God, show me what you want me to say, Lord, how you want me to act. I'm going to live. And you can, you, it can become a habit of walking, listening to the voice of God and the love of God rather than the old way you used to think about stuff. You renew your mind to the truth of who you are and how to live. It will start growing. I'm telling you, there's folks all around here that's been doing this. Where'd they go? For a number of years, and we see them walking this victory. Right in here for years, 20 years. We've got folks walking in this victory already, man. Come and be a part of it. Hallelujah. Amen. Now... This is to my Father's glory, John 15, 8, that you bear much fruit. He wants you to bear much fruit. And as we do, He is glorified. So where your life used to not bear glory, not bear much fruit for the kingdom because you weren't in the kingdom, you couldn't bear the fruit of God because you weren't connected to the vine, so whatever you tried to do wasn't bearing much fruit. But God wants you to bear a lot of fruit. He wants you to walk in the abundance of his life because it glorifies him. Remember, the purpose of redemption is glory. So when we're walking in the glory, it glorifies God. He wants your life full in abundance of his blessing in him because it overflows out of you and glorifies him. Amen? Look, if you want your life blessed, let me give you good news. You got God's will on your side. He wants to bless your life. Amen? There's some by the Holy Spirit and the truth of the Word. He's going to show you and adjust areas of your life so you were living short of the glory in this area. Now, praise God, He's showing you how to live here and how to live here. And all of it is already in you. We just want what's in you to come out and shine. Wow, it's amazing. Hebrews, James, Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, 3 and 4. No, excuse me, chapter 2. No, I'm sorry, I'm right. 2 Peter chapter 1, and let's start in verse 3. 2 Peter 1, 3. Sorry, guys, you got it now? 2 Peter 1, 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. <laughs> guys, it's supernatural. When we're born again, His divine power is now in us and has already given us everything we need for life and godliness. Some are praying, Lord, I need you to do this and I need you to do that and I need you to give me more of this and less of that. And it says here, His divine power has given you everything you need already. 
But how do you get it? How do you make it? How do you make what is there come to pass? By faith, you substantiate what is done and put it a part of your life. Here, it says, through our knowledge of him. A lot of Christians struggle and stuff they don't need to struggle with by lack of knowledge. Maybe they're going to the wrong church and hearing the wrong mess. <laughs> Hello? You need to hear the truth of the word of who you are in Christ and learn how to bring it out. Amen? Through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, He has given us His very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature. Oh my. This isn't blasphemy, what I'm going to say. It's the Word of God. The divine nature of God is in me. I didn't earn it. I didn't work to get it. By faith, I believed in the Son. And now I'm a participant of the divine nature. You who are believers have the nature of God. You've eaten the fruit, Jesus. You've taken in the seed, the word, Christ. It's producing the life of God in you. The divine nature is in you. If we can sometimes maybe turn off some stuff of the world and, you know, listen to the word, hear the word, focus on the word, and speak the word and start letting this divine nature in us start coming out in how we think and say, you'll get to realize it. Okay? It's there. It, I see it. Okay? From now on, I regard no one from a worldly point of view. I don't see you as the world sees you. From now on, I regard no one from a worldly point of view. Because if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. I'm not looking at any of you as a, as a worldly sinner. I'm seeing you as God sees you as a new creation in Christ Jesus, holy, blessed. Amen? That's what I see. Amen? When you're speaking to someone, your child, your son or daughter, whatever, don't speak negative stuff if they're born again. Speak what Christ says about them. Don't speak what the world's. Don't even speak what the circumstances or the evidence, what your eyes see, but speak the Word. The Word is more true than what your eyes are seeing and that your ears are hearing. I'm telling you, this is how we appropriate what God has given. By faith in His Word, we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart and then see with our eyes. So if your son or daughter or person or life or marriage or anything struggling, don't speak about the struggle. Don't speak about the problem. Speak about the Word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because the word is more real than what you see with your eyes. It's a faith walk. Hallelujah. So good. Through them, you have, you're participating in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. We escape the corruption of the world of evil desires. How? Because I know we're participating in the divine nature. Praise the Lord. Man. You know, I enjoy teaching so much the Word of God to you. I see people over many years who've received it. It's changed them. They're excited about it. They share it. They live it. See their lives. Hey, they go. To, they, get, they get books. They read their scriptures. They visit other churches that are... Folks, it's, no, we're, not, we're not trying to contain anyone. And hey, you have to, you know, it's, it's, it's this church and, and this pastor and this. No, no, we want to give you the word. This is the same word that Paul taught. This is the same word that's been around. It's going around all over the earth. See, God is bringing his people to the fullness of all his truth. And as we grow in this truth, we're becoming more like him. As we become more like him, his glory is being revealed around the earth. 
It's happening everywhere, man. It's happening fast and it's multiplying in you. Father, I thank you right now for this congregation. I thank you for the truth of your word of who we are in Christ. Lord, we thank you for the message, hallelujah, of your eternal purpose. Your eternal purpose has to do with the glory, glorifying you by glorifying your people who are walking in you. Amen. We give you praise, Lord, that you didn't leave us short of the glory. You made a way to bring the glory back to every aspect of our life. Bless this congregation, Lord God, to see it in their spirit, to believe it in their heart, to confess it with their mouth, to read the scriptures themselves, to take it in and to proclaim it and walk in it. In Jesus' name. Hey, we love you all. Y'all have a great and blessed day.